and we'll have Irma talking about her exciting result. So much excitement. <laughs> so much excitement. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I'm talking about verification of quantum computations. The question I'm addressing is whether a classical computer can verify the result of a quantum computation. In this model, I'm going to assume the output of the quantum computation is classical. So the quantum computer is solving a decision problem, and the classical computer would like to verify whether the output is correct or not. The first problem which comes up immediately is that quantum computers compute in superposition. Since the superposition can be over exponentially many bit strings, this means that the classical description is exponentially large. This immediately eliminates the possibility of the classical computer simulating the quantum computation and checking by comparing the output to his simulated output. The next issue is that classical access to a quantum system is extremely limited. The classical machine can only see measurement outcomes. So although the system might be exponentially complex, the classical machine can only access n bits of information at a time. I'm going to be looking at this question through the framework of interactive proofs. In 2004, Daniel Gottesman asked if a classical computer can verify the result of a quantum computation by interacting it with it over many rounds. This is called an interactive proof, and in this setting, the classical machine is called the verifier, the quantum machine is called the prover, and the verifier's goal is to only accept the prover's answer if the prover outputs the correct, uh, the correct output of the co quantum computation. So the first thing you can ask here is whether the classical results concerning interactive proofs hold in this setting. So in classical complexity theory, interactive proofs are well studied, but the model is a little bit different. The verifier is still an efficient classical machine, but the prover is now an all-powerful machine. In this model, it's known that IP equals P space, which means that all problems which can be computed in polynomial space can be verified by a verifier interacting with an all-powerful prover. The issue here is that although BQP is contained in P space, so this tells us that uh, the verifier can verify BQP if he's interacting with an all-powerful prover, I'd like to ask whether this is possible if the prover is not all-powerful but just an efficient quantum prover. Okay, so since this question was asked in 2004, it's been well studied, but the model was relaxed in two different ways. In the first relaxation, the classical computer was allowed access to a trusted quantum computer. So he had his own quantum computer, a small one, maybe a couple qubits. And the question was whether he could use his small quantum computer to verify the result of a general quantum computation. So it turns out that this is possible, and the work was initiated in two different lines of work, one by Broadbent, Fitzsimmons, Kashefi, and one by uh, Dury, uh, Michael Benor, and Aladabon. The idea here was that the verifier could use his small quantum computer to perform some type of encoding on the qubit. Then he could send over this encoded qubit to the prover, and because the prover didn't know the encoding, the verifier could track the prover throughout the computation and ensure that the prover behaved honestly. Yeah. So this also requires quantum communication, which you don't allow in your model. Right. So he uses his small quantum computer to produce qubits and send them over. And then the rest of the communication is classical. OK. And then in the other relaxation, uh, Ben talked about this earlier this week. The classical verifier is allowed to interact with two provers instead of one, so he can test them against each other. This uh, was also shown to be possible by a paper by Reitgar Anger Vazirani in 2012. And the rough idea here is that the verifier can play a game with the two provers. And if the provers pass with a certain probability, the verifier is assured that the provers share certain states. And he can use this guarantee to force the provers to carry out a computation. In this talk, I'll go back to the setting where you have a classical computer and a quantum prover. And here, I'll use post-quantum classical cryptography to allow the verifier to control the behavior of the BQP prover. So the verifier will use the fact that the BQP prover cannot break this quantum secure cryptography in order to force him to perform a computation. To do this, I'll require a specific uh, post-quantum crypto primitive called trapdoor claw-free functions. So first, let me define what this is. It came up briefly yesterday, but I'll define it again here. OK, trapdoor claw-free functions. So the first thing is they're 2 to 1. 
There's a trap door which allows for efficient inversion. So given a point, given um, an image Y, the trap door allows a party to extract both pre-images of Y. Next property is claw-free. So a claw is two pre-images which map to the same point. And claw-free means that it's hard to find a claw. So it's hard to find a pair of pre-images which map to the same point. So a quantum secure instantiation of a trapdoor claw-free function was created in a paper with Zvika, Paul, uh, Tama, and Umesh. And the main advantage, the reason that trapdoor claw-free functions are so useful in the quantum setting is because a quantum computer can sample an image Y and it can create the corresponding superposition over the claw. Now, as it stands, this isn't that much of an advantage because a classical computer can also sample a random x0 and the corresponding y. The reason this turns into an advantage is because the quantum computer can use this superposition to sample a string d, which satisfies this linear equation. OK, so because of this advantage, uh, trapdoor claw-free functions can be used by a classical verifier to test a quantum prover. What's exactly the advantage? The advantage is this linear equation. So he first creates a superposition over a random claw, and then he can sample a string d, which satisfies this equation. And we don't know how to do this classically. Without a trapdoor? Yeah. So the, the um, a quantum machine can do this just given access to f. Yeah. OK, so given this advantage, you can come up with a way that the verifier can test a quantum prover. Yeah? In the definition uh, for the trapdoor, you're given y and some extra information. Otherwise, there's, that contradicts the hard to find a claw. No, because he's not finding a claw, right? Uh, further up. Uh huh. So I'm saying it's hard to find a claw, but here he's just creating a superposition over a claw. Where is his given y? It's don't have the trapdoor. And something else? Uh, sorry. No, if you have the trap door, you can find a favorite. If you don't have the trap door, it's fine. Let's find any claw. You are not even given one. Yeah, but, but if, you don't, door, if you don't have the trap door. Yeah, if you have the trap door, then everything is easy. If you don't have the trap door, then you can't find any claw. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this relates to your question. There's something interesting here, which is that uh, hard to find a claw, this is assumed to be hard. Yeah. But what you're writing below is that the quantum computer can do something that involves both the images. Yeah. So it's, it's possible to do that bottom thing without yeah. actually finding a claw. Right. That's, that's right. So this is much weaker than finding a claw. He's just finding some parity. Okay. Given this setup, the verifier can test the quantum proof. Yeah. Once you sample, following up on your question, once you sample this D, um, do you have access again to the same claw? No. no. <coughs> because it ruins the superposition. So I'll show you in a second how you actually do this, how you create the superposition and sample D, but you can only do one. You can only hold one or the other. Uh, yeah. So given this setup, the verifier can challenge the quantum prover. And the way he does this is he first selects the function f, and he asks the prover to produce an image y. And then he, uh, at this point, he already has leverage over the prover, because once the verifier receives y, he can use the trapdoor to compute both inverses, but the prover cannot compute both inverses, because that would be finding a claw. Given this leverage, the verifier can test the prover in one of two ways. In the first challenge, he just asks for a pre-image of y. And if the prover behaved honestly, then he has this superposition, and he can just report it, and he'll pass the test. In the second challenge, measure. yeah, so he can measure the state in a standard basis and report, and he'll hold either x0 or x1. In the second challenge, he can ask for d, so the string d that satisfies that linear equation. And again, if the prover behaved honestly, this is possible. This format, uh, this challenge, the verifier's challenge of the prover, was first used for randomness generation. And the idea here is that 
there's a, we have a hardcore bit property for our trapdoor qua free function, which says it's hard to hold both a string D, which satisfies this linear equation, and one of the two pre-images. So that means if the prover is passing this test that I just laid out, then he must be, he can't be deterministic. Because if he was deterministic, he could hold both and violate this hardcore bit. OK, so that's how the setup was first used. And now I'll be using a similar structure, but I'll be using it for verification instead. What you mean yeah. by hardcore bit is that if the prover were able to learn both, then he could just you know, get the pre-images or just the like, find claws. Um, we don't quite prove that he can find a claw, but we're just proving that it's hard for him to hold both. So what we show is that if he holds both, yeah. he can violate some learning with errors assumption. Oh. The thing is that, I mean, you, you don't, if you could get many Ds for the same x0 and x1, then of course you can't cover x0 and x1. Right, right. But here right. you don't, right? Every time you I get, see. it's a, a different D and it's for a different I call. see. OK, because you know, these all seem like very special hardness assumptions. But you're saying they all just follow from hardness of LWA. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll use the same setup, but for verification instead of randomness generation. So here, instead of proving that the prover is probabilistic, I'd like to use this to constrain the prover. I'll use um, an extension of the approximate trapdoor claw free family built in the randomness paper, but I'll need um, a couple more properties, which is why I use an extension. So I require the hardcore bit property that I just mentioned, and I require one more hardcore bit property it's written here, but it's not uh, necessary to understand this now. I'll mention it again later. OK, so now let me go back and say how you create a superposition over a claw and how you sample a D, which satisfies the linear equation. So the first thing is the uh, BQP machine can just create a uniform superposition over the domain. Then you can apply the function in superposition. And then you can measure this register to obtain Y. At this point, he holds the state x0 plus x1, because the only remaining elements of the superposition are those that correspond to y. Now, how do you obtain the string d? You just perform a Hadamard transform on that state. So the result of the Hadamard transform is this state. And the only uh, d with non-zero amplitude are those for which d dot x0, x or x1 equals 0. So once he performs the Hadamard transform and measures, he obtains a D, which satisfies this linear equation. OK, now I'll tell you the outline of um, my talk. The first thing I'll do is I'll define a measurement protocol. The measurement protocol ideally is supposed to behave in the following manner. The prover is supposed to construct an n qubit state row of his choice. The verifier chooses one of two measurement bases for each qubit, and the prover should just report the measurement of rho in the chosen basis. This is the ideal operation, and in a second I'll define, I'll define the measurement protocol. The next thing I'll do is I'll link this measurement protocol to verifiability. I'll do this using known results. And once I'm done with this, then I can construct and describe soundness of the measurement protocol. Okay, before I get into the measurement protocol, I'll just remind you about um, standard and Hadamard basis measurements, because I'll be using those. So if you start with a single qubit state psi, a standard basis measurement results in a bit b with probability alpha b squared. And a Hadamard measurement consists of applying the Hadamard transform to this state, which results in this, and then measuring in the standard basis. Okay. Um, okay, so now I can go into the measurement protocol. The goal of the measurement protocol is to use interaction to force the prover to behave as the verifier's trusted measurement device. So in this side, I have the model which I've talked about. This is a classical verifier, a quantum prover, and they're interacting. Here, I have a verifier with a trusted measurement device, which enables the verifier to perform either Hadamard or standard basis measurements. I'd like to use interaction to force the prover to essentially just create a quantum state of his choice and measure in the basis desired by the verifier. And if I can force him to behave like this, this is equivalent to the verifier holding his own measurement device. 
Okay, so when you have a protocol like this, what's the first issue that would come up? It's an adaptivity. So if the prover is supposed to do the measurement for the verifier, he of course doesn't have to fix a quantum state and measure it in the basis chosen by the verifier. He can pick different, he can just pick a different distribution for each measurement request by the verifier. So maybe he never even held a quantum state and he instead uses classical distributions for every possible query by the verifier. So when I define the measurement protocol, which I'll do now, this is the main thing that I need to take care of. I need to ensure that there exists a quantum state underlying the measurement distribution obtained by the verifier. Okay. So this is the soundness. So for a measurement protocol, I'll say it's sound if it satisfies this condition. If the verifier accepts, there exists a quantum state, which I'm calling rho, which is independent of the ver verifier's measurement choice, which underlies the measurement results. Yeah? I don't know if I want to ask this question now. But, um, <laughs> so it's uh, basically you're doing a device independence thing. Right. Uh -huh. Then with what you're saying, it's sort of you're assuming the correctness of quantum mechanics. Or what does it mean that you're saying that there exists a quantum state? Why is that assuming? Oh. It sounds like you know, the whole thing does assume quantum, the validity of quantum mechanics, which is fine. fine. Yeah. So, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> yeah, because in order to prove this, I need to characterize how the prover is behaving. So I say he follows the protocol, and then he applies a unitary operator. So I'm assuming the correctness of quantum mechanics. You use it to model the prover, right? You say it. Yeah. Yeah. start with an arbitrary prover. I mean, that arbitrary yeah. prover is represented by some units. <coughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if, and, if, you know, in your song, I mean, like, if you could make, if the prover were able to make multiple non-collapsing measurements, then it could surely cheat in this protocol. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I'm glad I asked. <laughs> okay, so now let me formalize this. So in this side, with the interactive proof, you have a prover P, and the verifier chooses a basis choice H. So this is represented by an n-bit string. There's one of two bases for each qubit. And at the end of this interactive protocol, the verifier ends with a distribution, which I'll index by the prover p and the basis choice h. Now, what I want to say is that this distribution is equivalent to the distribution which have, would have been obtained by measuring a fixed quantum state rho in the basis choice indicated by h. So this is formally stated here. If the prover is accepted with high probability, then there exists a state rho such that for all basis choices h, these two distributions are computationally indistinguishable. So this is, this is proving my, what I wanted to show, that there exists a quantum state underlying the distribution obtained by the verifier. Sorry, but it's not, it's not saying there actually exists a quantum state. It's saying that there's a quantum state where it would have been hard to distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a that's a big part of it. It could have existed. It, well, you couldn't you can't tell whether it existed or not. Right. There's a quantum state that, well, that yeah. leads to that those results. But that's that's functionally perfect. You're not assuming I mean the prover could be like some piece based thing and then it could just be computing everything. And you're right. not ruling that out. Sure. So, yeah. But you're saying under the computational assumption, yes, there does exist a quantum state. Exactly. Under the computational assumption, it, 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 it exists. exists. It doesn't mean that the prover actually does, but it means yeah. that such a state exists, and this is good enough. Very yeah. right? Yeah. Well, okay. The, the, a, a quantum state mathematically exists that's consistent with that, and we're never concluding that the prover holds it. No. 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 How can you do that? That's what I, that's what I referred to about the correctness of quantum mechanics before. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. And, and 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 why do we not need that? Oh. Okay. Oh, how could you ever you know, but, Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, why does it uh, matter? Well, okay, but you know, under a computational assumption, you might actually be like, able to compute. Even think of a classical right? empty statement, right? You, well, okay, well, right. You, would need, you would need a computational assumption that would separate quantum from classical to, to, get, to get to such a conclusion. And then I guess you're not making such an assumption. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh. <laughs> right. You right. need if, more than that. Well, no, no, no. If you assume that something is hard. Classically, and the prover does it, and you know, and yeah, but we don't know that right, quantumly you can do it without yeah, some other fine. state, right? Yeah, all right, fine. All right, I get it.
Okay, so this is the measurement protocol. Um, so what I've done so far is I've said that I've defined a measurement protocol. So it's a protocol between a, a classical computer and a quantum computer, which satisfies this model. So it's equivalent to this model in which the verifier has a trusted measurement device, and the prover is just sending over a, a state row. So now I'm back to the model which, I ca which came up earlier in the talk in which the verifier has some quantum device to help him. So now all I need to show is that in this model, where the verifier has this trusted measurement device, quantum computations can be verified. And this is already known. Yeah, so this is already known, but I'm gonna, I'll cover it now. But this is not um, part of this paper. Okay, so to cover this, let's go back to classical verification for a second. To verify an efficient classical computation, one thing that can be done is that the verifier has some instance of a problem which he wants to verify. He reduces it to a three sat instance, asks the prover for a satisfying assignment, and verifies that the instance is satisfied. I can draw an analogy to this in, a quant in the quantum setting, where three sat, the three sat problem corresponds to the local Hamiltonian problem, an n bit variable assignment x corresponds to an n qubit quantum state. The number of unsatisfied clauses corresponds to the energy of the quantum state with respect to the Hamiltonian. So given this analogy, the verifier can verify an efficient quantum computation by reducing the instance to a local Hamiltonian instance h, asking the prover for a ground state, and verifying that the ground state has low energy with respect to h. Now, if the instance is in the language, then there will exist a state with low energy. And if not, all states will have sufficiently high energy. So let me just give a bit more detail about how the verifier would verify that a state has low energy. A local Hamiltonian H can be written as a sum over uh, terms HI, where each HI is local. It acts on at most two qubits. And we know that to measure with respect to HI, only Hadamard and standard basis measurements are required. So when the verifier estimates the energy with respect to H, he only has to perform Hadamard and standard basis measurements. Okay, given this, I can go back to this model and say how the verifier would verify that some instance is in the language for BQP. The prover sends over the state row to the verifier. The verifier chooses a term of the Hamiltonian at random. And then he measures the energy with respect to that term using only his Hadamard and standard basis measurement device. So now the only thing that I would have to do to use my measurement protocol for verification is to plug in my measurement protocol in place of this trusted measurement device. Okay, so that's all. So this is, this is how the measurement protocol links to verifiability. And now I can get more into measurement protocol, but this might be a good time for questions. So again, it seems like if you just wanted to prove, let's say, that the prover had quantum power, forget about proving, you know, the output of this particular computation, right? Mm -hmm. Seems like, you know, just using this basic uh, uh, claw-free construction, you know, can, can we not do that? Because, you know, we say, you know, force the, the you know, the prover to make the superposition measure, yeah. but then get superposition over a uh, over a claw and then you challenge the prover to do one of two things right that's what's happening in the randomness yeah you're right uh, uh, yeah right, right. Uh, that's what uh, tom i talked about yesterday yeah okay fine okay good 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 so so but but then that that proves not only that there's randomness but also that there was you know under the computational assumption that the prover really held a quantum state the quantum state didn't just platonically exist the prover held the prover held it right I think again, it's, I mean, it's, it's I mean, under the computational assumption. They generated the assuming the prover is quantum. Though, yeah. So where does it end? Yeah, the prover is quantum and is not post quantum, and the computational assumption holds. Under all of that, do we not conclude that the prover literally held this quantum state? Well, or some, it's or some. It's the prover could have held some other. Well, or some other state. But we okay. Do, we do, but we the, well. Yeah. We do, All right. We do. Yeah. Up to this some unitary. Yeah. Up to some unitary. Up to some unitary. We do conclude that it has the ability to create a state and apply a hard energy yeah. state and measure in two different bases that make some angles. But uh, I, that. I mean, for for that, you can also ask the prover to factor, right? If you just want to see if the yeah. quantum <coughs> power. Yes. Yes, I, I know. So but so I'm just saying, do anything in BQP intersect and B. No, I know, but I'm just asking whether this thing in particular does that, right? That this ability 
to return, you know, either x0 or x1 or else the you know, linear equation, right, is a quantum ability, right? It's a proof of quantum. So, but, but somehow that's not what you're using here. I am using that, but I need to extend it, right? Because I don't just want an arbitrary quantum state. I want the specific ground state of the Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that wouldn't prove the universality. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the leap from the previous result. Yeah. yeah. I see. So the, the computational thing is, is saying that it could be some actually legitimately different quantum state, not just unitarily equivalent, but it's one that has kind of the same, same effect computationally. Right, because all I'm trying to verify is that an instance is in the language, right? So if it's computationally indistinguishable, that means this ground state test can't distinguish between it, right? So that's still verifying that the instance is in the language. So specifically, it's enough for what I'm trying to do. But for example, in the randomness setting, it wouldn't be enough. So computationally indistinguishable means quantum computationally indistinguishable in this case. Meaning a quantum adversary can't distinguish. Yeah. Sorry, the sentence you said before in that question was what, what, what wouldn't work? Well, so this computational indistinguishability, it's, it works in certain settings and not in others, depending on what you want, right? Like for the randomness paper, we needed information theoretic randomness. I think by works, you mean it's sufficient, right? So sort of right. your yeah. guarantee that's proven is that some distribution is computationally indistinguishable from another distribution. That doesn't give you entropy guarantees, right? So if what you're interested in is entropy guarantees, you need statistical indistinguishability. That's different. So now that I've linked the measurement protocol to verifiability, I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about the measurement protocol, how it's constructed, and how I prove soundness. The first thing I have to do is go back to trapdoor claw free functions. So in order to use them for the measurement protocol, I need a little bit more structure. So instead of just a single function, which is 2 to 1, I'll have a pair of functions, f0 and f1, which are injective and have the same image. The reason that I need this function is because I don't want an honest prover to just create a random superposition over a claw. I want him to be able to entangle his state with the claw. Because remember, he's picking a state of his choice. Let's call it rho. And the verifier wants, him to force, wants to force him to do something to that state. So this is just adding structure. And it enables him to entangle a state with a claw. I'll tell you how to do this in a second. But the effect is that there's just a single qubit state psi. He can entangle it with a random claw. And you can think of this as an encoding of the state psi since the prover doesn't know the claw. So he's done some transformation to the state, but he doesn't quite know what it looks like. The reason this is useful is because once the prover reports y to the verifier, the verifier now has leverage over the prover state. So the prover got to choose the state psi, but the verifier knows what the encoding is, and the prover doesn't. Now, how do you do this? So the first, the verifier generates a trapdoor claw-free function pair, f0, f1. He hangs onto the trapdoor, and he sends over the function to the prover. But again, how are f0 and f1 related to each other? <laughs> They're just, so before I had one function, which is 2 to 1. Yeah. Now I have two separate functions, which are, which are injected with the same image. OK, good. All right, all right, all right good. Yeah. Think about that every collision has the first bit different. Yeah, I got it. The verifier generates a TCF and the trapdoor. And now the honest prover uses this to entangle a single qubit of his choice with the claw. So he first just starts with a single qubit state psi. He does the same thing where he creates a uniform superposition over x. But now he chooses which function to apply based on the qubit, his single qubit. And when he does this and he measures this to obtain y, then it collapses to the encoding that I told you earlier. And now the prover reports y to the verifier. And the verifier uses the trapdoor to extract the two pre-images of y. Okay, at this point, once the verifier receives y, he chooses either to test the prover or to delegate measurements, so to request a Hadamard or a standard basis measurements, measurement. In the case of a test, the verifier just requests a pre-image of y. If the prover was honest, this is the state he holds. He can measure it in the standard basis. 
he'll obtain a pre-image. And the point of this is now the verifier has controlled the prover's behavior to a very small extent. So he knows that the prover applied the function and holds a pre-image of the function. So this is the point of the test round. Any questions? I, I missed something. So yeah. what are they like? Uh, oh, he just created any single qubit state of his choice. So it has like to he any, created that single qubit state. Sorry. But, but like he should do it uniformly? Half half? No, no. This is, yeah. She can be what? Wait. It's the prover's choice, so. Um, choice, but then you moved. Construct a protocol, so what do you tell them? What, what do you you say construct whatever state you want. So let's say in the context of verifying the quantum computation, the state that the prover creates is supposed to be a witness for the validity of the computation. Oh, so I see. It's, That's this, from, uh, I it's, see. it's that I see. state. From, okay. So the alphas are kind of whatever the ground state of the I computation. see. I see. Okay, got it. And, uh, from, from the and can you remind me what's the connection here to the local Hamiltonian instance that we're trying to verify? The connection is that the prover is supposed to be constructing the ground state. Right, but, but I mean, of this yeah. state, uh, how, how is this state related to the ground state? Think of it as just one qubit of the ground state. Of the ground state. state. Yeah. Let's wait until you read it. Wait, but, 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 but then, you know, and, and we don't care about its entanglement with all the other qubits of the ground state? Okay. I'm just doing this to simplify the. Uh, yeah, right, right, so right. technically this would be a much larger state. It would be an n qubit state, and he would be doing this process for each of the n qubits. But I'm just dealing with one qubit right now. Wait, but, but, each, but each qubit considered by itself is, some, is in some mixed state, right? right? And, and you know, so, so it's not a superposition by itself, but, no. but, but that's going to be okay for us? Yeah, because he can just do this. Um, okay, so he'll have an n qubit state, and he'll yeah. have n different functions, yeah. and he just does all of them at once and reports n wise okay. for the verifier. And then I can apply this analysis to each qubit separately. Because what the analysis does is it doesn't control the prover's state, but it controls the deviation. I guess what what's kind of bothered by it, yeah. this is not uh, uh, disturbed by entanglement to other to other qubits. Okay. All right. Okay. We have to argue. Yeah. <coughs> All right. All right. That, it's mainly due to the independence between all of the n different functions. So all the n functions are picked independently. All right. so that's why. Okay, so this is the point of the test, that the verifiers control the prover's behavior to some extent. Now, how do you delegate Hadamard basis measurements? So the goal here is the prover should be able to apply a Hadamard transform to his state and measure it, because that's what the verifier wants to see. He wants to see the Hadamard measurement of the state. The problem here is that due to the encoding, there is now interference. So when you have x0 and x1, now it's hard to perform a Hadamard transform. The solution to this is to get rid of the interference. Yeah? By created they prevent interference. They prevent interference. Yeah, sorry. OK. They interfere with interference. Exactly. Yeah. OK, so x0 and x1 prevent interference. And the solution is to apply the Hadamard transform to the entire state and measure the second register, which gets rid of this issue. Okay, so what this does is it results in a different encoding. So when the Hadamard transform is performed on this state and it's measured to obtain some string D, then it results in a different encoding, which looks like this. So now you have the state H psi, which is what you wanted to get initially, but it's off by a bit flip operator. So X is just um, a classical bit flip applied in superposition. And this bit flip operator is a function of the claw and the string D. And OK, so now this is the honest protocol for applying a Hadamard measurement. The prover starts with an encrypted state psi. He applies a Hadamard transform to the entire state. He obtains the measurement D, the string D, and he obtains a measurement for the first qubit. And now the verifier decodes, because the verifier has to strip off this bit flip operator. Okay, so are there questions? Yeah, just to yeah. clarify, so when you write h on the first line there, you yeah. so this is a um, um, n plus 1 yeah. h. So uh -huh. it's on the, um, where you should have been, yeah. but you actually do also h is on the Everything, right. yeah. Yeah, so you do an h to the whole thing. 
and D results from measuring the second register after the half transform. Okay. So this is the honest application of the Hadamard transform. Um, maybe this needs, uh, I don't know what that's the um, the, So ha, what is the verifier get from the prover that he needs to decode? The verifier gets a string D which is the result of the Hadamard measurement of that second register. And he also gets a bit, let's call it B. And what he does, and the bit B is the result of measuring the first qubit in the Hadamard basis. And what he does is he takes the bit B and he XORs it with this. And that has the effect of stripping off that bit flip operator. And so now the verifier's final bit stored is M, but that's the result of a decoding. So the point is, if you behave honestly, this M is really like measuring yeah. each of the stuff. Yeah, exactly. But if you behave dishonestly, then I can take advantage of this, and that's what I'll do later. I'll take advantage of the fact that the prover doesn't know the decoding. So that's what you're, you're now going to show why it's secure? Or? No, so what I'll show now, so so far all I've done is the Hadamard measurement, and the next thing I need to t tell you is how to do a standard basis measurement. And once I do that, then I can start telling you why it's secure. Okay, so, so far, what I've shown is how the verifier would delegate a Hadamard measurement. To do this, he sends over a trapdoor claw free function, F0, F1. The prover reports Y. The verifier chooses either to test or to request a Hadamard measurement. Now, remember the soundness guarantee. I need there to exist a quantum state independent of the verifier's measurement choice, which underlies the distribution obtained by the verifier. That means when I try to delegate a standard basis measurement, the prover shouldn't be able to tell that I'm delegating a standard basis measurement. So I can't do sim something simple, like just ask him for a standard basis measurement here. That wouldn't work, because then he could distinguish, and then he could change his distribution dependent on the basis choice requested by the verifier. So what I need to ensure is that the prover's messages are computationally indistinguishable when the verifier requests a standard basis measurement. Yeah? So why is that the case? Like in principle, the prover could be aware that I'm asking for this or that measurement. Uh -huh. Could be constrained for other reasons to report to me, you know, what I actually ask. Right? Sure. Yeah, but in this protocol specifically, he's being told at this round had a martyr standard. So what he could do is he could pick a distribution for each basis and report it when he's asked. Because you're not going to be able to cross check. Right. So this is after the test. So I test him once just to test the format, and then I ask him for Hadamard or standard. And if he knows which one, then he can pick a distribution. Then. Yeah. But presumably there could be a protocol which doesn't. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll show next is that to delegate standard basis measurements, the verifier only needs to change the first message. And he changes the first message in a way that it's computationally indistinguishable to the prover. So all he does is he replaces the functions f0, f1 with some different functions, g0, g1, which are computationally indistinguishable to the prover. And what these functions are, are instead of, so before f0 and f1 were trapped or claw free functions. They were injective and they had the same image. g0, g1 will be injective, but their images will not overlap at all. And I need the guarantee that the functions f0, f1 and g0, g1 are computationally indistinguishable. Now the point of this is if the prover encodes with G0, G1, this has the effect of standard basis measurement. So what's happening here? This is the same thing as before, where he applies a function in superposition. But now when he measures this, since the images of the function do not overlap, this part of the superposition will collapse. So just applying this encoding results in a standard basis measurement, and the prover d does not know that he did a standard basis measurement. And the important part here is that when he responds to the verifier with the image y, the verifier can actually extract the standard basis measurement, because he can invert the function y and determine whether the pre-image comes from g0 or g1. OK. so. This is a standard basis protocol. In the standard basis protocol, the verifier just sends over G0, G1. The prover reports Y. The verifier asks to test or Hadamard measurement. 
But now the verifier can extract the standard basis measurement from Y, so he can ignore whatever the prover does in the Hadamard measurement. Okay, are there any questions? So uh, I'm still missing you know, how we're verifying not just that there is a quantum state, but that that quantum state is the ground state. Okay, so, so that's now the, the measurement protocol only verifies that there's a quantum state. Then I plug it into this uh, QMA type protocol. Which you haven't discussed yet? No, I did. That, that was earlier. So this is when I said that the measurement protocol links to verifiability. Yeah. And that's just saying that there exists a quantum state with low energy. So as soon as I say the prover is creating a quantum state, then I can say, if the instance is in the language, there exists a state. Otherwise, he can't do anything to pass. Uh, uh, OK. So the thing I'm getting around is him just creating distributions which don't correspond to quantum states. I see. So the prover is really just trying to convince the verifier that there is a quantum yeah. state uh -huh. that has this energy. So the answer to, like, to, to a QMA problem. I yeah. shouldn't even think of it as a BQP question. It's a QMA question. Sure. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, this problem, this wouldn't work for QMA because of the computational assumptions. But yes, it's. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't work yeah. for QMA because the prover can't actually create the ground state, right? Yeah. But, right, but if you tried to extend the prover to QMA and then, yeah. Right. Yeah. The restriction about EQP instead of a QMA machine is on the computation is indistinguishability of the. Right. Yes. Because a QMA machine could break learning with theirs. No, but, but you can think of but the protocol for QMA, you can think of the honest prover as a BQP machine that gets, in addition, the QMA witness, right? Right, but then you'd have to assume something about advice states, right? Like, you'd have to assume that learning with errors is secure in the presence of a state created by a QMA adversary. Like I, this, I think that's OK. This is just a non-uniform, this is like sort of the quantum analog of non-hardness of LWE, right? You get a quantum advice, and LWE should still be hard, right? Yeah. But LWE challenge is independent of this, like, advice. Right, yeah. But if I give you a superposition of the samples of the LWE, then you can break the LWE. Well, it's independent. It's, it's independent of the LWE instance. It's all of them at the same time. Right? No, it has to be it's independent from the secret. Yeah, yeah, all of them? Secret. You can't generate samples if you don't have the secret. OK. So, so is it true that in that sense, it is like a sort of a QMA, uh, QMA protocol? Right. If the prover had many copies of the QMA witness state, then he could do this. And he was a BQP prover. Why do you need many copies? Because um, there's amplification. Yeah. If you just have one, you only have an inverse polynomial gap, and that's not good enough. I have a different yeah. question. Maybe it's coming up, but it's yeah. with respect to the testing. Uh -huh. So the way you presented this, there was a test, and the test just involved um, returning a value pre image. And then the part about uh, the equation, like the inner product, that yeah. was used uh, to decode the outcome. Right. It was never tested in any way. No. It's not going to be tested? It's not going to be tested. So the only test is really just that you can find the image when you're asked Yes. To. That's it. Okay. So this is the recap of the measurement protocol. The goal is to use the prover as a blind, verifiable measurement device. The verifier selects the basis choice, either Hadamard or standard. If it's Hadamard, he sends over trapdoor qua-free functions. If it's standard, he sends over trapdoor injective functions. The prover encodes the state, reports why. The verifier chooses either to test or to request a Hadamard measurement. Um, OK, so this is a full protocol. And the next thing I'll talk about is soundness. So if there are any more questions about the protocol, this is a good time. So just to clarify, you use yeah. a quick magic here twice. Uh, first, to make sure to strip out, to strip away the uh, the x zero of x or x one, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And second, to blind whether you're doing a high yeah. or a right. Uh, standard. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty important. The standard and Hadamard. Okay, so again, you know, where in this <coughs> protocol is the verifier consulting his local Hamiltonian and checking it? Okay, so he runs this protocol, yeah. and at the end, he's guaranteed that his measurement distribution comes from a quantum state. Yeah. And then he uses the Hamiltonian test to analyze the measurement distribution and determine the energy of the state. Okay, Have, uh, but yeah. uh, you already discussed that? Or I can go back. Oh, right. No, I don't. I mean, I'm, uh, yeah. Okay.
Yeah, let me just. Okay. Maybe it can be explained very simply. I mean, uh, okay. all, all that she's trying to say is yeah. that the prover has a state, yeah. and the verifier wished, I mean, he wished he could have measured it with the XX or ZZ operators. Yeah. If he could, yeah. then he would have been able to estimate the energy, and that's all he needs to do. So the measurement protocol just guarantees that this is what he's doing, even though he doesn't have access to the state. I see. All right. All right. So I guess some X, X, and Z. There's a lot in this topic that's kind of new to me, but I'm trying to keep track of something. Energy is mentioned from time to time. Mm -hmm. But is energy being used for any purpose other than quantum science satisfiability? No. Okay. It's so, just used at the end. So, so, so it's just whether the state satisfies tests or not. Not the, the, the amount of energy otherwise just doesn't matter. And it's not really... It does in the same sense that it matters in QMA. It's not... It's not just for, it need not be frustration free, there's a gap. No, but if you're interested in BKP, Well, sets, no one quant things. quantum satisfiability with, oh, I see. Well, okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure. Quantum satisfiability with a statistical gap. Well, okay, fine. That's Okay. So if we can if we can back up to something really basic, you're saying, you know, does there exist a state such that these XX and ZZ measurements return this energy? That is a QMA complete problem. Yes. yes. All right. All right. So we're as long as you commit to the state problems. before you yeah, decide yeah, yeah, yeah. which to Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. right. So we're using it. So so it's a it's a special case of two local Hamiltonians. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. We're trying to solve that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Be parallelized, right? So you don't need any theorem for parallel. So you can do it, it just takes four rounds. Uh, yeah, this just takes four rounds. So but what it, are, yeah. You don't need polynomially many rounds. Like no, because you can uh, QMA amplification, so you can just use many copies. Yeah. But you don't need any special theorem. Huh? IP is known to be middle sum. Yeah. Yeah. What, what? I mean, the model of interactive proofs is just known to reduce some of this from the qualification. It's a... Yes, yes, that's This is arguments, it's not proofs, though. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Okay, so this is... Um, so, so far, I presented this protocol, and it seems like it might be sound. But it turns out it's only sound if you have certain hardcore bit properties, which are satisfied by the functions. So here, I'm going to give you a counterexample of why things would break down if these hardcore bits we're not satisfied. But I'll go through it relatively quickly. And if people are interested, I'll stay on it. Otherwise, I'll move on. Uh, OK. You started late, so you got to 1020. 1020. OK. So the cheating strategy that we were trying to avoid is that the prover creates a different distribution for the standard basis and the Hadamard basis, meaning there is no quantum state underlying the measurements he reports. So I'll show that this is possible if um, these hardcore bit properties are not satisfied. So recall the cheating strategy. The prover fixes two bits, BH and BS. BH is supposed to be reported for the Hadamard basis, and BS is reported for the standard basis. And he fixes these bits so that they pass whatever, um, whatever Hamiltonian test the verifier wants to do later. OK, now assume that there's a claw x0, x1, and a string d for which the prover knows both um, x, b, s. So this is one member of the claw corresponding to the bit b, s. If b, s is 0, he knows x, 0. If b, s is 1, he knows x, 1. And he also knows this d dot x, 0 plus x, 1. So this violates the earlier hardcore bit, but here I'm assuming that doesn't hold and showing how he could cheat. So if he knows both of these values, then he can ensure that when the verifier um, receives the measurement results, for the standard basis, he obtains b, s. And for the Hadamard basis, he obtains b, h. You're also assuming that he can tell whether No, a... that's, that's what I'm going to show now. He can't tell, but he can still do it. So I'm saying blindness isn't enough for verifiability. You need the hardcore bit. OK, so to compute y that he reports to the verifier, the prover just evaluates the received function on XBS. So in the case he received f, he evaluates it. And for g, he evaluates it. Now for the standard basis, and so when asked for a Hadamard measurement, the prover just reports the string d for which he knows the inner product. And he reports bh x or d dot x0, x or 1. 
Now for the standard basis, the verifier is just going to invert y, so he's going to store xbs. For the Hadamard basis, he's going to look at this, thing, this uh, bit reported by the prover, and he's going to XOR it with this, so he'll obtain bh. So now the verifier obtains exactly what the prover wanted him to obtain. And the prover did not have to compromise blindness. He only had to know this hardcore bit. Okay, if there are questions, I can stay on it. Otherwise, I can move on. All this example is showing is that blindness is not enough for verifiability and that the hardcore bits really are crucial to make this protocol work. OK, so now, since I said that, the intuition, the first step we need for proving soundness is these two hardcore bit properties. The first one is the one that I just mentioned. So it's just saying it's computationally difficult to compute both a D, which satisfies this equation, and one of the two pre-images. And the other one is a little different. It's saying there exists a string D such that for all claws, that bit is the same bit, so it doesn't vary over the different claws. And it's computationally difficult to guess that bit. So this didn't come up in the counterexample. It seems a bit more unnatural, but it, it's needed in the proof. OK, I, it's not necessary to fully understand both of these. Yeah? Uh, no, it's just as long as it exists. Just one. Yeah. OK, so now how to prove soundness. To go into this, I'll talk about the two previous models which I talked about in which the model was relaxed a little bit. The key step in both of these models was enforcing some structure in the prover state, meaning enforcing that the prover holds a state and then controlling how he uses that state. So I'll first say how that was done and then say roughly how I can do it in my protocol. Remind me, what were the FK17 and the APM7? What, what, what did those do? Uh, these. Oh, OK, because the, the soundness proofs and both of the initial results were incorrect to varying degrees. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So. so those are correct. The yeah. Okay. OK. So in this model, where the verifier holds a quantum computer, enforcing the structure of the state is relatively easy because the verifier can just encode qubits and send them over. Now he knows what the prover's initial state looks like since he created it. And then he can use this knowledge to track the prover throughout the protocol. In the two prover model, it's a little bit more difficult. The verifier plays a game with the provers. And based on their winning probability, he says that they hold certain states. They actually hold bell pairs. And based on this, then he can say that the provers behave in a certain way throughout the rest of the protocol. Wait, are you saying you needed error correcting codes to fix the proofs of the ABE and the BFK results? Well, error correcting codes were already there in the protocol. Oh, really, really. The soundness in the in Dorit's paper, the the soundness protocols were wrong, but the protocols were mostly correct. Okay. 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 So now, how do I do this? this enforcing structure step, how do I do it in my protocol? I don't have a quantum computer. There's no extra prover to play a game with. So the first step is I'll use the test round of the measurement protocol as a starting point. So what the test round guaranteed was that the prover applied the function in some manner, manner because he held a pre-image. So that's saying at some point in time, the prover state has to be in a superposition over the pre-images of the point y that he reported. So this is a very weak statement. It's just saying at some point in time, I know his state looked something like this. Like This is just a bunch of extra space. But I know in some register, he held a pre-image. And now I want to take this statement and bootstrap it up to say that actually he's holding a full quantum state. So how do I do this? This is where the decoding comes in. And the decoding is very crucial. First, the prover, OK, we can assume the prover starts with a state like this. And at that point, he's supposed to apply a Hadamard. But let's say instead he deviates from the protocol. Deviation can be modeled by an arbitrary unitary operator u. So he applies an arbitrary operator u to the state. But now, when the verifier receives a measurement, remember he's decoding with this d dot x0 plus x1. So this means the unitary u is um, it's conjugated by two different forms of computational randomness, which are unknown to the prover. This is one form, the decoding. And the other form is that pre-image register, which the prover doesn't know. I have a question. Yeah. I agree. What you prove 
so far by the test is that the prover knows the preimage. Yeah. The rest, if you tested him, uh -huh. he would have been right. But maybe the quantum state that he actually has has nothing to do with it. Maybe mm -hmm. he generated X B, and, right. you know, and the quantum state is God knows what he got. Okay. But somewhere in his state, there's a preimage. That's maybe it's a question of notation. This is pretty much exactly what's written over there. I see. So in the sense, the only thing is that's written is that saying that the prover has a state, and somewhere on that state you is written, everything you know, is your state. answer, I and see. then yeah. everything else is some stuff that's called psi. I see. There. I see. Okay. So the state. Okay. Got yeah. it. Okay. Okay. So this is saying that. This unitary U is kind of randomized by two different forms of computational randomness. This is a very common thing that comes up in interactive proofs, and it's called the Pali twirl. And it's saying that if your unitary U is conjugated by randomness, then you can simplify the unitary significantly. Like in the strongest form, you can take the unitary and just reduce it to a Pali operator, which is very simple to take care of. So here, my issue is that I don't have that structure. I have some computational randomness. But in order to use it, I'd have to convert the computational randomness into some form, like some form in which I can use it for the Pali twirl. And once I do that, then I can use it to simplify this deviation u. So to do that, I rely on this is computational. The Pali twirl really has to be information theoretic, right? So I have to take, and it's not even quite the Pali twirl because, because the prover controls d. So it's not, it's not a random decoding chosen by the verifier. It's adversarially chosen. So in order to convert this to a Pali twirl, I have to use the hardcore bit properties. So I use the hardcore bit properties to argue that this really is a Pali twirl, a, a very um, elementary version of Pali twirl. Yeah? Say in a sentence, what's a Pali twirl? Oh, yeah. OK. Um, so if you have, no, no, it doesn't. If you have a unitary acting. So you have some state, and it's encoded by a random Pali operator. This is a bit shift, and this is a phase. This is the quantum analog of the one-time path. So this is a random operator. And like in um, the paper with Dorit, the verifier just performs this encoding. So he picks a random Pali, and he applies it to the state. And the prover deviates. And when the verifier receives the state, he again decodes. This is called the Pali twirl when you have a unitary U, which is conjugated by two random Pali operators. And when you have this, then you can take this and average it over the randomness of the Pali operator and say that this essentially cuts down the unitary U to just act as a Pali operator, which is a very simple form of deviation and can then be handled pretty easily. And here, I'm just trying to take this idea, the fact that if you have a unitary and it's conjugated by some randomness, which is independent of the unitary, then you can simplify it. So I'm saying my randomness is these claws and the hardcore bit. So you're saying any operation that is applied on, a, on an encrypted state yeah. is actually really just a Pauli, a Pauli operation? In this right? case, yes. Yeah. In my case, it's going to be weaker, but it's but, enough. But, but, yeah. but, 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 but why is that? I mean, it seems like you could still be anything, right? After the decoding, we can see that it could have been anything. Well, it's randomized yeah. by the decoding. Well, yeah, but, but once it's randomized, then, then it's not even a poly. We could just say, you know, even stronger than that, it, without loss of generality, it's the identity. No, no, no. It would be the identity if you took this away. Yeah. But because of, the, because of both of them, you don't just get the identity. You, essentially, what happens is um, a unitary has cross terms acting on a state. But if it's randomized by this, you just get rid of all the cross terms. And so you just have a convex sum over Pauli operators acting on a state. OK, so I want to use the Pali twirl, but my difficulty is converting this computational randomness into a form in which can, it can be used for the twirl. And to do that, I rely on the hardcore bit properties. So this is why they're so crucial. Um, that's it. So I show that verifiable secure delegation of quantum computations is possible with a classical machine. I'm relying on quantum secure trapdoor claw-free functions, which can be built, built from learning with errors. I use this function to first characterize the initial space of the prover. And then I strengthen the claw-free property to complete the characterization and prove the existence of a quantum state. We have some more questions. 
<laughs> so the last few slides of your talk were they like what's the relation to what you were doing earlier than that were you just like going over and explaining it in a different way uh, no I was defining the protocol and saying what I want right well yeah but, but you had already get sort of given the protocol you'd already sort of said why there has to be a global state and then you kind of did it again I didn't say why there I said if there is a global state, then I can use QMA verification techniques to verify, but I didn't say oh. why. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the whole ending part was to say why there has to be a global state. Okay. 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 I think it was like 40 pages. <laughs> <laughs> or, or more. I have a quick question. This, this trapdoor cloudfree function that you construct in this paper, is it the same as the one in the the, the talk that uh, Tomah talked about, or is it a different construction? Uh, it's the same construction, but I have to extend it because I also need these injective functions. So I also build the injective functions, and then I need another trapdoor. I need another hardcore bit property. But the hardcore bit property, I use their construction, but I just um, prove that the hardcore bit property works. So suppose the original computation is like n qubits and t gates. Uh -huh. How much work is being done in the various kinds of computation? Mm -hmm. um, for the original computation, are you talking about the computation to construct the history state? So all he's doing is he's constructing the history state, and then he's encoding it by applying a function in superposition. That's it. But suppose the original circuit that you would like to execute yeah. on somebody else's computer is t gates. Uh -huh. And uh, how, much, how much work is t gates is being done? So that's just the conversion from the original circuit to constructing the history state? In what terms? What do you mean? How many gates are being done in the verified You will not assume. You know how you can. Yeah. You just create the history state. You create the block. Superposition. How many times t? How much is that? So it's I think you're talking about t. Or. It's linear in T, I think. You just it's linear in T? Because you create a clock. But you usually the end. And then you control yeah, the infinite end bits of security. You don't have the polynomial. Yeah, there's a So, so the basic okay. answer is it takes okay. it's polynomial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in, in terms uh, of practicality, it's, it's, it's polynomial. <laughs> <laughs>